everybody today. Thanks for being here. It's really good to see you. Can we bring up the house lights just a little bit? And that way I, that statement can truly be accurate. Okay. They're coming up. All right, it's good to see you today. Uh, my name is Al, and I'm the lead pastor at Compassion. Uh, my, it's my privilege to, to be uh, with you today and to present to you uh, what God, is, uh, God has, is kind of pushing us in this direction in this sermon series that we're going to be in which we'll talk about in just a few moments. If you are a first-time guest, uh, one thing that we would love to do is connect with you and uh, to have a record of your attendance today. You would, uh, if you would just do us a special favor and take a few moments right now, fill out the connect card that is uh, on your row and let us know about you. You can fill it out front and back and there's all kinds of information that you can receive from us. And if you'll do that for us, we will give you a $5 Starbucks gift card just as our way of saying thank you. So uh, after you've completed that, uh, you will, uh, you can just either leave it where you are seated uh, seated, or you can take it out to the lobby and drop it in the basket out there at the connecting point desk. And so we'd love to be able to to know that you were here today and we appreciate you being here as well. Uh, I also want to look into the camera and say good morning to those who are watching uh, from home today. You're watching, maybe you're on the road, you're at work, wherever you are. We're glad that you're watching uh, through Facebook Live, church online platform, or YouTube. We're grateful that uh, you're joining us today and we hope that you are maybe going to invite someone to join you as we uh, go through. We have about two more weeks of this series, and so I'm uh, actually one more week of the series, and I'm excited to to just share with you what uh, remains in that, and so we're grateful for you watching today. Um, I want to start this morning uh, by having you take out your message notes. Uh, Take out your message notes, and you can follow along and see kind of where we're going today, and you can fill in some stuff. Now, as uh, as you're getting that out, I want to read to you and start this morning with a quote from John Wesley. A, uh, he was a church planter, a pastor of you know, all kinds of great things that uh, he was really kind of responsible for, the Methodist church that we know, and then there's the Wesleyan branch uh, that the Nazarene branch even came out of. So John Wesley was very influential in Christian thought, and even to this day, hundreds of years later, he has some great things to say. Listen to what he said. It's very timely in light of what we've been talking about. He said, I met those of our society who had votes in the ensuing election. And advised them, so he's giving advice, number one, to vote without fee or reward for the person they judged most worthy. Number two, to speak no evil of the person they voted against. And number three, to take care their spirits were not sharpened against those that voted on the other side. Now, I really like that approach. I can, I can resonate with that. And I think that if more of us in the church would actually take that same attitude, then I, I believe the world would stand up and, and take notice when things are going well. And they could see our unity in that. And uh, our, our world would definitely t- stand up and take notice. Now, we're in week number two, as I said, of our series called Talking Points, the perfect blend of of politics and religion. This is not, you know, this, this, the topic uh, or the, the title of this series is not original with me. Uh, the, the idea comes from Andy Stanley from North Point Church in, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. But I, I've noticed that several different ministries and pastors that I follow are actually preaching about these topics uh, in, in these few weeks, even though they may call it by a different name. In fact, one that I really enjoy is uh, J.D. Greer, who's, a, who's actually is a Southern Baptist Convention president this year. He's the pastor of Summit Church in the Raleigh-Durham area. He's, he's doing a series called Flags. And basically he says it's called Flags because we all rally around a certain political banner in times like these, right? So, you know, we're flying our flags. And he suggests that we actually go back to a Hebrew term, a name for God, which is Jehovah Nissi, which means the Lord is my banner. And what, what his, his series is all about, allowing the Lord to be the flag under which we march. And I, I like that as well. That's brilliant if you ask me. So this series is about how you and I as believers can live out our faith, but also be involved in the political process. Now, the church is not supposed to be a place where everyone sees the, same, uh, sees the issues the same way, right? Now, doctrinally, we should really kind of get along on that. But when it comes to things like politics, we don't always have to agree because if you have a church where everyone sees the, the issues the same, that's called a cult, all right? And that's not what we are. So we're not trying to promote that as well. So in, in fact, the church is supposed to be a place where people from different segments of society actually come together and find common unity in Jesus. 
So it's vital that the political questions that are out there be discussed, but we need to make sure that we're running it through the filter of our faith, which, which unites us, right? So the bonds in the body of Christ, Christ have to be stronger than our political affiliation. And the banner under which we march should actually compel other people to greater allegiance to Jesus than the banner of any political party. So we're not, we're not trying to to win someone to the Republican Party or the Democratic Party or the Independent Party. It's not about being red or blue. Now, as we discussed last week, there are very few subjects that actually divide like politics. There there are very few topics that get us fired up and more vocal, especially during uh, an election season. And the important factor, as we talked about last week, was we can disagree politically, but we should love unconditionally. And this does not make our political differences go away. It's not ignoring what, what, you know, the things that we don't see eye to eye on. That's okay. It just means that we try to determine if our preferences line up with the truth and whether or not we will go our separate ways relationally because we disagree, which I hope that we won't. And so the question with which I want all of us to grapple this morning is a simple question. The simple question is, does your approach to politics demonstrate God's priorities? Does your approach to, to how you view politics, does that demonstrate the priorities of God? And before you scream out the answer, uh, I want you to hear me out for the next few minutes, okay? But before you do that, just listen. Now, as a pastor, I don't talk from the pulpit about my political views. Not because I don't have political views or not because I don't think my political views are good ones, but my calling is different, you see, I have a different calling than, than many of you who are not uh, in, in the located ministry. And I don't know, uh, rather, I do know that if I discuss, like, my political views from the pulpit, what I say could be misrepresented as representing the, the authority and the voice of the entire church, even if I give disclaimers to say, well, but, you know, these are my own views. I only speak for myself, not for the church. That would still happen. And what would happen is that Compassion Christian Church would get identified with my politics, and that would keep me from being able to preach the gospel to the, to the people in Delaware. So there are some things that we must be clear about and united on, and that is, first of all, the, the sin of racism and discrimination. Like, we should all be united on that. We should be united on the wickedness of abortion. But I might be wrong in my opinion on other things like global warming or nationalized health care, but I am not wrong about the gospel. I'm not wrong about how God wants us to, to believe, and I don't want to let my opinion on the former issues keep people from hearing me on the latter issues of the gospel. So another thing I want to be clear on is I don't think the church should be a place where we avoid talking about politics. I actually think this should be a safe place where we can come in and, and have uh, really some, some civil some civil arguments, some civil uh, disagreement on things, but we understand that God is definitely in favor of the government. After all, God is the one who delegates his authority to the people in government. Now, maybe there's someone in this room who is, who is very much involved in the political system, or you're considering getting into it in the future. And I would say, maybe today is going to be eye-opening for you as well. But what we do today is that we look like we always do in the scriptures, and we can find examples of what we're talking about. You see, there are examples in the scriptures of God-fearing men and women who served the public in public offices, and you could even say they were essentially politicians. Deborah you might remember, was a female judge over Israel. Joseph, the he of the coat of many colors, served as a prime minister in Egypt. Daniel served in Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. Nehemiah was a trusted official for Persia's king Artaxerxes. And so I, I mentioned last week that the, there was even political diversity within the, the group of the apostles, right? That's significant because our loyalty to Jesus and his kingdom must always exceed our loyalty to an earthly agenda. Right? So this morning, I want you to consider two ways of looking at politics, the traditional way or the kingdom way. And this outline that I'm going to use today comes from a book written by Scott Sauls called Jesus Outside the Lines. But let's first of all consider politics, the traditional way. Now, if you want to see this, look over in John chapter 18, because the traditional way of politics is demonstrated when Jesus had interactions with someone named Pontius Pilate. 
You might remember him from the Easter story. Uh, and so uh, in John 18, uh, the, the scene is, is this. Jesus has been arrested. He's been brought by an angry mob in front of Pontius Pilate, accused of being an enemy of the state and a threat to the place of Caesar in the worship of the citizens. Okay, And so Pilate wants to hear it straight from Jesus. He wants to know, so he asks him a question that is posed in John 18, verse 33. He says, Pilate, uh, it says, it says, Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? To which Jesus responded, you go down to verses 37 and 38, You say, I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Even on the side of truth, ev everyone on the side of truth, rather, listens to me. What is truth? retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. So what Pilate then does is demonstrating traditional politics. He makes a concession, according to the Jewish custom, that he could release one prisoner for the, for the feast of Passover, and the crowd is there, and they pressure Pilate to release Barabbas. Now, Barabbas is a known murderer and an insurrectionist, and, and they say, you know what, L release Barabbas to us and crucify Jesus in Barabbas', uh, Barabbas place. So Pilate is the consummate politician. He wants to assuage the crowd. He wants to please them, and so he accommodates, he gives in. And Jesus, the innocent man, gets the death penalty, and Barabbas, the guilty man, goes free, and I want you to understand that this is how traditional politics often work. You see, the goal of politics today, the traditional way, is to get you and I to support a particular vision for the world and then to conduct our lives according to that vision. Politicians use the same strategies today that Jesus' accusers and Pilate used. I want to list them for you. First of all, power is misused in traditional politics. Worldly politics are all about power. It's the currency of ruling people. Pilate finds himself in this dilemma, right? On the one hand, he believes that Jesus is innocent, that he's not guilty of anything that the crowd is accusing him of. And on the other hand, he knows that Barabbas is guilty. But because he is in a dilemma, he is desperate to please the crowds. He wants his, he wants his approval numbers to stay up. He considers these accusations against Jesus. He goes back and forth between his private chamber and then back out to the crowds. And even though Pilate knows who's innocent, he can't decide whom to crucify and whom to set free. So what's happening? We can assume that Pilate is trying to, you know, kind of do the old lick your finger and you know, see which way the political winds are blowing. He, he's weighing out and wondering, how am I going to benefit from this situation right now? How am I going to save myself? And in weighing which decision would be best for his own approval rating, as well as preserving his status, he decides, you know what? I am going to reluctantly allow you guys to have Jesus to crucify. You see, Pilate was yearning for the favor of the crowd. But in traditional politics, when conscience and the crowd are at odds... The crowd usually wins, right? Majority usually rules. When the crowd always wins, bad people can go free and good people can suffer. It reminds me uh, of a scene from the animated movie Shrek. Anybody see the movie Shrek? If you have grandkids, you probably did. You should see it. It's an animated movie, yes, but it's actually very funny. Uh, in the movie, the antagonist of the story is a ruler named Farquaad. Now, Farquaad, which is a weird name, is a single man, and he's got designs on marrying Princess Fiona, who's been locked up in a castle far away, guarded by a deadly fire-breathing dragon. And so many would-be rescuers have lost their lives in failed attempts to save Fiona. And so Farquaad comes up with the idea of a competition in which he's going to allow knights to be placed inside an arena like gladiator style and duel against each other until only one of them remains standing. And the prevailing knight then will have the honor of going out on Lord Farquaad's behalf to rescue Fiona. Now, viewers begin to understand in, in this, uh, as you watch the movie, that Farquaad is a coward 
And it's ironic that he offers then this pep talk to the knights before they turn against each other in the arena. Listen to what he says. He says, brave knights, you are the best and brightest in all the land. Today, one of you shall prove himself. That champion shall have the honor, no, no, the privilege to go forth and rescue the lovely princess Fiona from the fiery keep of the dragon. If for any reason the winner is unsuccessful, the first runner-up will take his place and so forth and so on and so forth. And this, listen to what he says. Some of you may die, but it's a sacrifice I am willing to make. Now that is a summary of the traditional way of politics. Your hopes, your desires, your ambitions, your reputation, and if necessary, your life are worth sacrificing in order to protect my agenda and advance my ambitions. The end justifies the means. That's one way that traditional politics can be distinguished. And the second way is that truth is often manipulated, to which we all say amen, right? This is the reason that the manipulation of truth is called spin, You put a spin on it, right? That is why we have fact checkers who go behind speeches of politicians and say, here are the untruths that this person spoke. You know, this is what they said, but this is what really is the truth. This is actually seen in the exchange between Jesus and Pilate. And even in how Pilate is interacting with the crowds. When Pilate asks Jesus if he is the king of the Jews, it's not because he's interested in spiritual matters. He's not saying, are are you the one? Can you save my soul? he's, He's not worried about that. All he cared about was whether Jesus was a threat to his power. Jesus, are you for me or are you against me? Are you for Caesar or against him? Because if you're against Caesar, then we can't be friends. How many followers does Jesus have? How is Jesus doing in the eyes of the public? And the only reason Jesus is now standing before Pilate was because the crowds had put a spin on Jesus' teachings about the kingdom of God. They twisted it to mean that Jesus was an enemy of the state and thus an enemy of Pilate. And Pilate's agenda was not at the forefront of their minds of uh, of the accusers of Jesus because his growing influence threatened the status quo for them as well. So in order to keep Jesus kind of in, in line, they had to lie about him. They had to create a false narrative about him and they went public with it. And that eventually is what led to his death. So how about you? How about me? Do we often exaggerate or spin or tell a half-truth to protect ourselves or to protect the status quo? How easily do we get pulled into the politics of spin doctoring? I mean, some of us can get numb to this traditional political method so much so that even though we are people who claim to be people of the truth, We begin to accept those lies and and we become willing participants in the politics of the world the traditional way. And so what happens is partisan caricatures and and partisan politics uh, becomes something that we just accept. So my question for you today is, how do you feel about leaning toward a, a certain political party? Here's what I want you to know. Matthew did it. Matthew had a political party that he liked. Simon the zealot did. And Jesus actually allowed that. But what's important to see is that a partisan split and a partisan spirit can actually create disunity in the church of God. I mean, if there was ever a partisan crowd in the Bible, excuse me, if ever there was a partisan crowd in the Bible, it was this crowd that comes and is pressuring Pilate to release Barabbas and crucify Jesus. And so Barabbas, a criminal, goes free. And Jesus, an innocent man, is executed after having his impeccable character assassinated. And that is what partisanship does. You see, friends, if you are staunchly Republican or staunchly Democrat or somewhere in between, be careful that you don't go to the extreme of inflating the best features of your preferred party while inflating the worst features, real or imagined, of the other party. Don't ignore the weaknesses of your own party while dismissing the other party's strength. Be a person of the truth and speak out when truth is important. So that is politics the traditional way. Now let's talk about politics the kingdom way because they are vastly different. When we see politics through the filter of our faith and through God's kingdom, we're going to reject the world's methods of misusing power and manipulating the truth. 
So what does it look like for us as a church to live out Jesus' vision in our daily lives? I mean, for one, let, let's start with this from the scriptures. It's uh, the church lives out our faith in the political realm by taking care of widows and orphans, by advocating for the poor, paying our taxes, honoring those who are in authority, loving our neighbors, being excellent employees, blessing those who persecute us. So here are two things to remember that will help you navigate politics the kingdom way. First of all, you need to understand that we will always be the visiting team. Using a sports analogy, the church will always be the minority. Some people believe that if we put more Christians in office and other places of power, that's the key to transforming the world. The, the, the idea is, the thought is, if only there are more people in power who follow Jesus, that would be a game changer that would make our world better. And, and, and we would have the peace that God intends. Now, it's a very good thing for Christians to serve in public office. But neither the Bible nor history supports the idea that holding positions of power is the key to bringing God's kingdom to, to earth as it is in heaven. It actually doesn't say that. Uh, in fact, on this point, I want to point, uh, I want to, I want to show you rather how Jesus actually resisted earthly power. Remember there was a time at the peak of his popularity when the people had thoughts about what they wanted Jesus to be. And he had a different view. It says in verse uh, 15 of John Verse uh, John chapter 6, it says, Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. So they wanted Jesus to be, it was like Jesus 2020 for them. You be our president, Lord. You, you be the one in power. Why would Jesus resist earthly power? Why would even someone who is political uh, a person after God's own heart, like David, King David even tell us in, Psalm, uh, in, in the Psalms. He said, he'd said, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. And then later he says, do not put your trust in princes and human beings who cannot save. So what I mean is that Christians have always flourished most when we are in a Jesus-centric, life-giving minority group. That's how the church will continue to thrive. It, it, it is through the diametrically opposed to the world's methods. It's, it's subversive. It's countercultural. But when we love and give justice and serve the common good, that's when we've always gained the most ground. That's when the church has always done better. I mean, in fact, Christians in ancient Rome faced severe opposition and persecution from the state. But even in that type of environment, they still enjoyed favor with all the people, according to the scriptures, because of the way they loved each other and because of the way they loved their enemies. When Christianity was made the state religion, a lot of people thought, oh, now this is going to be great. It actually got worse. The Christian faith faltered. Mediocrity was on the rise. People lost the, the, the flame and the passion. They went into a spiritual decline. They were being less salt and less light in their community. So you need to understand that we will always be the minority. I encourage you if you're, if you're a believer, if you feel like God is calling you into politics, do it. Do it. But understand that, that you, can, you can do your best work whether you are the majority, whether you're in power, or whether you're not. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that we really can do the kingdom politics and kingdom politics this way by being conservative and progressive. What I've learned is, you know, people who are conservative don't like to be called fundamental. And people who are progressive don't like to be called liberal because it seems like, a, you know, kind of a slur that you're giving against them. So that's why I'm using these words conservative and progressive. Now, the kingdom of Jesus does not advance through spin and political maneuvering and manipulation of power, are taking a stand for what we believe. I mean, do we ever see Jesus? Now, now what I mean is you should, you should state your views, but what I'm telling you is that, that we often see people living out their lives, being people of faith, and that is your stand. You see, the kingdom of Jesus advances through acts of love that flow from both conservative and progressive values. I think this is the beauty of the Christian movement. It embraces the very best of both points of view while pushing back on the flaws and the shortcomings and all the injustices that are inherent in both. So how does that actually work? Well, there's a biblical concept that we need to remember. It's the concept of justice. 
justice. The concept of justice, when we say it often, we only mean that everyone's rights are protected equally, and it does mean that. But biblically speaking, justice also means the obligation of those who have to take care of those who do not have. And our responsibility to use our resources to lift them up. The word justice actually occurs over 200 times in the Old Testament. And usually when you see it, you'll see four classes of people who are brought up. Widows, orphans, foreigners, and the poor. Widows, orphans, foreigners, and the poor. One scholar actually calls that the quartet of the vulnerable. And so the just person, according to the Bible, the person who wants justice is the person who is involved in helping all four of these groups. That's why we see this in Deuteronomy. He, speaking of God, he defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. You see, God considers it our obligation to look after those in in an impoverished and a vulnerable state. And God is going to hold us accountable for how we use our resources to lift them up. Now, I'm not saying that the best way that, that people get help is always through government charity programs. I'm just saying that the spirit we bring in this debate is how can we as the church lift others up? Now, some of us may want to respond, but yeah, but, but why are poor people poor? What, how do they get this way? And it's true. Sometimes people are poor because of their own sin. It's a drug problem or there's pride or there's laziness, a family breakup. They're, those are often factors in poverty, absolutely. But sometimes it's because of the sin of others. It's because of oppression or abuse or a lack of opportunities. Sometimes it's because of the general curse of sin in the world, like natural disasters or things like sickness or aging or mental incapacities. Usually it's a combination. And so many Christians will say, you know, maybe you say this, well, if someone is poor and it's not their fault, I'll be glad to help. But if it is their fault, I'm not helping them. They're on their own. And yet I get there are things that some people can only fix for themselves and they have to want it. And you can't work harder on a solution than than some people do uh, for, for themselves. I get that. But even if someone is poor through their own fault, show me where the gospel says that we shouldn't help them. Because our spiritual poverty was something that we brought on ourselves, right? Our spiritual poverty was was on our own accord, and Jesus helped us anyway. So I thank God for that. So Jesus said how well we understand the gospel is measured by how we respond to the poor. We should have no tolerance, no tolerance for statements or policies that denigrate and and harm people who are poor. That's why uh, maybe some of us need to be reminded of this proverb. Whoever mocks the poor shows contempt for their maker. Whoever gloats over disaster will not go unpunished. God takes it personally when a group of people is disparaged or mocked. And so should we. But you know, there's something else that Christians who are motivated by love and justice should care about as well. And that's the unborn. That's the unborn. You know, every day in our country, more than 3,000 children are aborted in the womb with the blessing of the state. Each of those lives are made in the image of God and they possess a soul and they're loved by him. God says in the 139th Psalm that he knows each of these children in the womb as individuals by name. Now the humanity of these children is not a debatable issue in my opinion. The biblical clarity here is overwhelming. Abortion is an affront to the authority of God and an assault on his glorious creation in the womb. For this reason, I think the church should also be full of people who are working to save children in the womb. And of course, it means that we love them from the womb to the tomb, that after they are born, that their lives matter, right? Christians have established literally thousands of crisis pregnancy centers all over the nation. And looking into those spaces where mothers are making the choice to keep their children, you can find it filled with people just like you and me, who who believe in Jesus and have a love of Christ. A lot of our church members, we need even more. Christians who are motivated by love will always be considered, uh, Christians who are motivated by, by love will always be considering the best way to help these innocent children. I want to point you to a passage in 1 Timothy chapter 2. 
verses 1 through 4, one of the ways that I believe that we can truly get involved in kingdom politics is to pray. In fact, we are commanded in Scripture, in 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 4, here's what it says. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So do you pray for your president? Do you pray for your governors, the senators, the mayors? Do you pray for God to bless them and, and lead them to a knowledge of the truth as often as you post about them? Do you believe in the power of prayer? Do you believe that God can change lives and change minds through prayer? We're going to be having a night of prayer the night before the election, the Monday night, right uh, Monday, uh, the night before the election right here in this room. And we're asking God to just, to just protect our nation. We're asking God to, to change the hearts of our politicians. We're asking God to be glorified and honored through what we do as a church and, and what happens. And so I hope that you're going to be a part of that because that is, that is the way that we truly get involved in the, in the political process at the ground level, by praying and lifting them up and interceding for those who are in power. So friends, I don't know which way you're leaning today, whether you're leaning toward the politics more so of the world and, and how things go and you just accepted it, or if you look at the, the, the kingdom politics and say, you know what, that's the way that I want to go. That's what I want to be known for. I hope that today that might be your choice. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we're grateful for the love and mercy that Jesus poured out on us, that while we were still sinners, he died for the unrighteous, the ungodly, the ungrateful. He died for us, Lord, even though we were enemies of his. He died for us, Lord, even when uh, we were trying to go our own way and save our own lives by our righteousness. Father, we're grateful for the humility that it took for Jesus to come and live as a human being and to go through the travails and trials of a human. But Lord, he did it because he knew that he was the only acceptable sacrifice for sins. So, Heavenly Father, in this moment, I pray that, that we would evaluate our political filter through our faith filter first. That we would see, Lord, what, what do I need to do as a kingdom citizen? What do I need to do, Lord, as, uh, as a person who's called to love? What does love require of me? And so, God, I pray that today in this moment, you would be honored and glorified in our response. Thank you, Father, for the nation that we live in. We know that it is not perfect. And we know that it is, you have no favorites, Lord, but we want to lift you up and honor you as a church, as a people, and as a nation. God, help us to turn to you. And we pray these things in the name of your Son and our Savior. Amen.